efforts and to understand your great and awesome plan that we may help him, Father, in the work that you've called him out to do in these last days. We bless you. We thank you, Father, for all these things, and we ask this thing in Yeshua's name. Hallelujah, Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Please be seated, man. Let's see. We ended up on uh, page 73. Let's back up to here just to page 72 here where it says, The gods are not perfect in righteousness. That's what sets them apart from Yahweh. Okay, Yahweh, Yahweh is perfect in all ways. And Yahweh, of course, wants us to be perfect. Because Yahweh's name himself means perfect righteousness, right? Complete righteousness. And that's what separates him from the gods. Uh, because a God is one who lifts himself up against Yahweh or against the righteousness that Yahweh himself stands for. Now remember what Lucifer said to Eve in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3 verse 5, he said, For he knows, talking about Yahweh, for Yahweh knows in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods, knowing righteousness and evil. And that's exactly what took place, Okay. Because Satan was speaking the truth here. And he says that Yahweh knows in the day that you eat of it, and he had told him, don't eat of it. Don't partake of this certain tree or this certain mixture, this certain food. But what did they do? They fed themselves on this food, on this forbidden fruit as it's spoken about. Okay? And notice what Satan says. Yahweh knows in the day that you eat of, eat of it, your eyes will be open. Yes, they were open. They were open to sin, okay? Not that they were, and they didn't open up some uh, mystical eye, third eye and so forth in their brain or, and, or their psychic or whatever to open up, but it opened their eyes up to what sin was. Before this time, they, they hadn't, uh, they weren't open to this, okay? And now this has opened up their minds to become as gods. Now they had this great desire. Before this, Yahweh was showing them what the potential of mankind would be and teaching him his laws. And now Satan says, okay, now Yahweh knows that when, the, when your mind is opened, okay, now you're, gonna, you're going to be no... But she tried to play it up and make it, no, um, make it into something. Spit it out, boy. Okay? She was trying to make it into something. Like, notice, it says, for Yahweh knows in the days that you eat of this, okay, when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be as God. So she was trying to make it... Like, ex, ex, just like the word God means to exalt yourself above Yahweh, that's what she tried to put in the mind of Eve here, that, you know, you will be as a God. You will know both righteousness and evil, okay? And you will when you make yourself as a God. You also don't have the understanding to know what, it, what righteousness and evil does either, that it's a mixture, and you can't live with it. But it's obvious from these words that the gods... Do not give, uh, do not live by Yahweh's laws. They practice a mixture of righteousness and evil. And they apparently live by some of Yahweh's laws, while they choose to break others. And that's shown in the scriptures where Yahweh speaks about this here in Psalm 82. Uh, in Psalm 82, 1 through 7, it says, Yahweh stands in the assemblies of the gods. Okay, so he stands there. It's not like he just calls them all together and say, hey, okay, here I am right in the midst of you, okay? But he does call them together. There are assemblies, okay? Just like we have assemblies, okay? Like on the Sabbath day, you come together and you assemble before Yahweh. You have a holy gathering. It's a holy convocation according to Yahweh's laws. Well, these gatherings are not holy in that sense, in the sense of Yahweh's holiness, for the fact that they're not there to worship Yahweh. But they're there as teaching sessions that he brings them together. And notice, um, he gives judgment among the gods, okay? He gives judgment. It's not that he's judging them. He, you know, if he judged them right then and there, he would destroy every god that there is. But he hasn't done that, has he? He didn't destroy Satan when Satan fell away. He didn't destroy Satan and come out against her and retaliate against her when she brought down Eve and mankind, okay, and cursed all of mankind. She didn't, he didn't do that whenever she instigated and put it into the minds of Cain to destroy Abel, okay? But judgment is, a, is the fact that the word judgment means 
to pronounce sentence for or against. Okay? And you remember what it says in Revelation, I will show you the sentence of the great whore who sits upon many waters. Okay? There, there's a, a sentence that's pronounced either for or against, either the righteousness or evil and the outcome. And it also means to govern uh, and to plead. And, and like it says, he pleads with all flesh, but he also pleads with the gods as well. And it means reason. Remember, Yahweh, the prophets in Isaiah said, come, let us reason together. Okay. So this is what he does. And Yahweh says, uh, how long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the sinners? You know, why is it that you're doing this? He says, you should defend the weak and the fatherless. You maintain, you know, that's what they should be doing. They should be keeping these laws, and that's what he's pointing out. He's teaching them, because all of this is you find these in the laws of Yahweh, exactly what he says there. And um, so when he brings them together like that, he teaches them his laws, and he points all of these things out. He says, you should rescue the poor and the needy and deliver them from the hands of the wicked. He says, notice in verse 5, you know nothing, you understand nothing, and you walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are shaken because of you. You know nothing. Okay, if you don't know the laws of Yahweh, you really don't know anything. You know, you, you don't have any understanding. You have no knowledge whatsoever. And he says, you understand nothing, because you can't have it. Remember what it says, the beginning of, of wisdom is the knowledge of Yahweh. Okay, you have to begin to know Yahweh. What does it mean to know Yahweh? To keep his laws. To make that covenant with him. You begin to know Yahweh. And then you begin to get the, under, the understanding. And then you can have the wisdom that is needed. And that's why he says here, you know nothing, you understand nothing. They lean on their own understanding. And that's what brings the confusion upon this whole universe. And causes the problems that, that you see in the universe today. And notice what he says in verse 6. I have made you as gods, you sons of the Most High. And like Adam, verse 7 is, is important, and like Adam, you will die. Just like the other rulers, you will fall. Now, remember what the scripture says. You reap what you sow. Okay? So he was warning them and telling them, you're going to reap what you sow. If you destroy are trying to destroy mankind, then that judgment will come upon you, okay? Because what you reap, you will sow. And you yourselves will die. Just as you're trying to kill off Adam or mankind, so you yourselves will die at your own hands. Remember what, what the, the judgment of the law is, that if you do something against someone, the blood will be upon your own head, Right? So for murder, the blood is rust upon your own head. And that's what he was telling the gods here. If you're going to try and destroy mankind, that bl their blood is going to be on your hands. And you're going to uh, reap the benefits of, of your evil ways, okay? If you want to look upon it as being benefits, which is what they try and do. They try and, instead of looking upon the laws as a benefit to man, they try and say, well, there's benefits in being evil. And that's how they deceived mankind into doing the things they did and remember that's what the queen of heaven did too we'll see that in a little bit but notice this death penalty remember like adam you will die keep that in mind like adam you will die now notice the death penalty also applies to those beings who have chosen to become gods now remember they chose to become this way they are beings that yahweh created who were the sons of Yahweh, but they chose to become gods. And that's the thing, is that with the Malachim, once they make a choice, that's it. They either choose to be righteous, remain righteous, or they choose to remain evil. But there's no way that they can repent from being evil and turn back to righteousness. Because they've made themselves into gods, they've exalted themselves above Yahweh. And once that is done, remember, it warps the mind. It changes the mind to where the mind is set towards thinking that, remember as it says about the priests, they're holier than us, right? 
They say, don't come near me, for I am holier than you. Okay, well, it's in their mind that this holiness, which means to set apart for a specific purpose, okay, in the case of Yahweh's priests, to be set apart, it means to be set apart for the sake of righteousness and holiness. But in, in, in the minds of the gods, they set themselves apart to make themselves above Yahweh. They can't come down and lower themselves down to the level uh, of where they can remain as humble servants because they've, they've turned from that and have gone the opposite way. And the only way you can do it, you've got two ways. You can remain humble or you can turn against that and exalt yourself. And that's what they chose to do. But remember... A scriptural definition of the word God, okay? In Isaiah 14, it's explained earlier, we saw where, you know, a male or female being, a human or angel, is one who exalts themselves above those who are his equal, or exalts himself above those who are above himself, or usurps authority to act on his own, or takes authority of possessions, not of his own, but by force, Okay, and, and, and again, this is exactly the same thing that Yeshua w was facing with. You remember? The violent men took the kingdom of Yahweh by force, he said. And then when they came against him, he said, Do you not know, is it not written, that Yahweh says, You are gods, okay? And you make yourselves to be gods because you won't humble yourself to worship Yahweh. And that's why you hate me and my disciples, and those who will come after me. Now, what we just read in the previous scripture here in verse 1, Yahweh gives judgment among the gods, which indicates that Yahweh teaches them his righteous laws. In verse 2, we saw that the gods walk in darkness. And that word darkness in Strong's is number 2825. It means darkness or misery. It's the same darkness as spoken in Proverbs 2, verse 13. Where it says, from those who leave the path of the uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. So if you leave the path of unrightness or righteousness, being righteous, that makes you upright in the eyes of Yahweh, then you will walk in the ways of darkness. And that's exactly what the gods do. Proverbs 4, verse 19. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. They don't know why, what makes them stumble. They don't, the world doesn't understand the reason why they're suffering the diseases that they suffer. They don't understand why they're underneath the curses that they're being, going through right now, which is a stumble to them because they walk in the ways of darkness. Remember, their eyes, their minds are blinded, as the scripture says. The guides of this world has blinded the minds of the people. Now, that's why Yahweh says in Psalm 82, you shouldn't be blind in the minds of the people, but instead, here's what you should be doing. And he teaches them the laws and tells them what they should be doing. Uh, like he says, you should be rescuing the poor and the needy and deliver them from the hands of the wicked. You shouldn't be turning around and blinding their eyes and causing them to be wicked and seek after, after wickedness and thinking that this is some type of reward that they can have and that they're better off that way than following my laws. Now, in Psalm 82, 5, Yahweh describes these beings as having no understanding of righteousness. They don't understand what righteousness is. And these, the gods, they're worshipped by all mankind all over the world. And you see this today. You can see it in, in every, any country. Pick any country that you want to go to, and you can go there, and you can find these different gods that they worship. And it shows the fact, too, that they're, there's a mixture of gods and there's so many different gods that, you know, even in the time of the disciples, remember, uh, the apostle Shaul went into the place that said it was the, the, the altar to the unknown God because there was so many of them that they want to make sure they didn't leave anyone out. And there's a reason for that because they're always, the gods always deceive mankind into thinking that they can have benefits if they follow them. Now, Remember, Yahweh is not a God. He never, ever, in the original scriptures, identified himself as a God. Never. You don't find it there. It's the twisting of the word when they took out Yahweh's name. And don't you think if Yahweh, as they say, 
that this is the holy scriptures, and scriptures means writing, so it's a holy writing. And if you take what the scripture says, that these writings came about by holy men who were inspired, don't you think if it's called the book of Yahweh and Yahweh inspired it to write it, that he'd have his name in the scriptures? But by Satan, what Satan has done by removing the name of Yahweh, she's put into the minds of people that God and Lord is acceptable. But you never, ever find in the scriptures where Yahweh calls himself a God or a Lord. In the original writings, it would be Yahweh because he says, I, in Isaiah 42, 8, remember, I am Yahweh. That is my name and my glory I will, and I, my praise I will not give to another. So how much plainer can you get than that? But, you know, it's not to, um, Yahweh plainly says in the scriptures too, not to worship gods. You know, not to, not to become like them. Not to make an image or a likeness to them. That's the law of Yahweh. Remember, don't make an image, which means don't make yourself into the likeness of this God. Okay, because uh, this paper clip can become a God to me. Okay, I can bow down and worship it. You know, that's not what they were talking about. It wasn't the idols. They had idols as representations, but it wasn't the idol that they were bowing down to and worship. The idol just was a representation to put in their minds what that god or the goddess that they worship represented. And it was just a, a remembrance, okay? Just like Yahweh has the menorah, okay? To, as a remembrance. He doesn't need it to remember. He knows his plan. It's his plan. But he has it there before his throne as a reminder to all those who come before his throne that he has a plan, well, the gods did the same thing with these images, these idols. It was to put in the minds of the people that who they were worshiping to keep it fresh in their minds. Now, as a result, now the king, you see the word, uh, it says don't worship any other god, as the King James says, but uh, that's been added in there. But as a result, the world's deceived into god worship, which they call idolatry. In most Bibles, but the word idolatry is, is, is more deceptive because it leads people to think into the worship of, as I said, some kind of physical object that's there. But in actual fact, the, the idols, will, they represent a god or a goddess. Now, Yahweh is the creator. He's neither a god or a goddess or an idol. His true identity is he's the heavenly father and he is the creator. And the Holy Scriptures identify him as the father, the creator, and the supreme head, as Yahshua did when he was instructing us how to pray. You know, he is the supreme head. He is the creator of the universe. He created everything that exists, including the ones who became known as gods. Which, when you think about it, okay, when they removed the name of Yahweh and they put Lord and God in there, they came up with the superstition, okay, of saying that, wow, the name Yahweh is just too holy to pronounce, so we've got to take it out of there, and we've got to use some other name. So they put Lord, or they put God. Now, in more modern times, they get to where they say, well, you know, we've got to remember that, what our forefathers did, so therefore, instead of God, you know, there's a big G, there's a big God, and then there's a little g, which is the little false god, right? So there's a difference between the god and the god, right? But what they did is, instead of spelling out god, now they put g dash d, because it's a holy name. It's a holy reference to the creator, the heavenly father, whatever, whatever they want to call him, okay? To the mighty one. You know, they won't even, they won't even call him the heavenly father even, you know, but so they put capital G dash D to say, well, this is a holy name and we have to remember that it's a holy name. But what have they done when they did that? By by removing that letter O and putting that dash there. Now they put it into the minds of the people that this word God, this being God is holy. 
Okay? But they already removed the name of Yahweh out. So by doing that, what they did is they elevated G-O-D up to, or actually they brought Yahweh's name down to the level of G-O-D. Because now, if they have to do away with G-O-D and just say G-D because God is too holy to pronounce or use, they've already destroyed Yahweh's name and removed it because it's too holy to use. So they try and put Yahweh down on an equal level with the gods. Okay, and that's Satan's attempt to try and put in the minds of the people that Yahweh's just another god. Okay, he's one of the gods. And that's why you look in Bible dictionaries and you see Yahweh, God of Israel. Okay, and he's not. He's the creator. He is the creator. That's what they forget. He created all things. Okay, so when Yahshua taught us to pray, he said to them, in Luke eleven two, 2, and he said to them, When you pray, using this example, say, Our Father who is in heaven. Our Father who is in heaven. Okay, the heaven is the heaven of heavens. You know, it's, it's not just up above the stars where we see. But it's the universe itself. Hallowed be your name. Notice. Hallowed. It's set apart. It's separate. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. In heaven and on earth, okay? So notice, your kingdom come, you know, let your will be done. The will of Yahweh is that all things will be made new. Remember, Kepha says that the world, the earth and the heavens will be renewed wherein dwells righteousness, okay? And so, he says, let it be done in heaven and in earth. Not just on the earth, but in the earth itself, okay? What composes the earth because remember the earth is living organisms okay even rock which we think is hard and has no life it has life it is a living substance yada just doesn't breathe as we do so we think there's no life in it yada 1 verse 25 says to to our only wise father and supreme savior through yahshua messiah our head to Yahweh belongs glory and majesty, power and authority, both now and forever. That's never going to end. You know, Yahweh is the only wise being. He'll always be the only wise being. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now, to the king eternal, immortal, which means, that means not immortal, but Yahweh is not immortal, but he has everlasting life, Okay. And invisible. Not that Yahweh's invisible, but you can't see Yahweh. Okay, it's just right now, with the human eyes and the flesh and blood bodies that we have, he's not visible to us in the sense where we can actually physically see him and behold him with our eyes. But Yahweh's not an invisible, gassy God, you know, floating around someplace. We're made in his image, being made in his likeness. The only wise Father, be honor and glory forever and ever. Hallelujah, Yahweh. Psalm 83, verse 18. Let no man, let men know that you whose name alone is Yahweh are the supreme head over all the earth. Notice, his name alone is Yahweh. There is no other being in the universe who has the name Yahweh. He's the first and only, he is the only being who has that name Yahweh. Now, we're going to be part of the Yahweh family, and when people see us, they will see Yahweh, just as Yeshua told his disciples. Philip, have you been with, been with me this long that you still don't understand that Yahweh is in me and I am in him? In Isaiah 48, verse 17, this is what Yahweh, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, says. I am Yahweh, your Father, who teaches you to succeed, notice. Not to fail, but to succeed. That doesn't mean that you're going to go out and be, you know, uh, run for elections and go out and make all kind of money and stuff, okay? It's not success in the world. He's showing us how to succeed in righteousness, remember, Okay? who teaches you how to succeed, just like he teaches the gods, takes the time out to teach the gods, to succeed, who
who leads you by the way that you should go to be able to be redeemed. Okay? To be able to be redeemed. Yeshua has made the way for us to be redeemed. However, it's our choice as to whether we accept that redemption or not. Okay? You remember the, the law of the slave. He served for six years in the seventh year, and he had to make that choice. He could go out free, or he could remain in the house of Yahweh forever and belong to his owner. Right? We have to make that choice, too. We have to make the choice as to whether we want to be redeemed back before, to Yahweh, because we were servants of sin, in all of these years, Yeshua has made a way for us to be redeemed, or we can make the choice to go out free and go back and become a servant of Satan once again. It's our choice. Isaiah 33, verse 22. For Yahweh is our judge, and Yahweh is our lawgiver. And Yahweh is the king, and he will save us. Now, the word judge, as I said, it means, it means to pronounce sentence for or against. It means to govern, to plead, to reason. And remember, all judgments have been given to Yahshua as the Son of Man. But a judge is one who has the power and authority to enforce the law and to make the proper decisions. Yahshua could not be the judge if he did not know that law. Okay? And that's why we need, need to know the law of Yahweh so that we can make the decisions and become those judges that Yahweh is looking for and is restoring in these last days. And so, by man, sin is into the world. By man, life enters into the world, okay? And by man, judgment will enter into the world. Like, he, like it says in Corinthians, do you not know that you're going to judge the Malachim? Okay? Well, the way you're going to judge that is Yahweh is the ultimate judge, and so Yahweh judges all things, but he leaves the judgment up to man. Okay? Like Yeshua, he's going to leave the judgment up to mankind because the judgments are already written. Yahweh has his laws, and he has his judgments. So therefore... In order to be a judge over man, you just need to enforce those judgments which Yahweh has already put into place. And so Yahweh is the judge. Yahweh is the ultimate judge over all mankind. We're just simply enforcing what he says. Okay, Isaiah 40, let's see, 45, verse 22. Look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am Yahweh, and there is no other source of power. No other source of power. That always reminds me of Acts 17, 28, when it says, um, For in Yahweh we live, we move, and we have our very being. Right? Because we are the offspring of Yahweh. We live, we move, and we have our very being. Because there is no other source of power. There is no source of life except Yahweh. You know, life exists. Remember, he made Adam. Adam was a complete body. Right there. He had made him. But he wasn't a living being. Until he breathed into him the breath of life. Remember? So he even had the blood in his body. But the blood didn't keep him alive. But when Yahweh put the breath of life in him and gave him life, then he became a living being. So in Yahweh we live and we move and have our very being. In Luke 10.21 uh, he says, In that hour Yeshua rejoiced in spirit holy and said, I praise you, Father Yahweh, of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. May this be so, Father, for this seemed right in your sight. Notice, he hid these things from the wise and the prudent. Remember, the gods want you to be wise in your own eyes. But this is hidden, he says, and is given to babes, the babes, okay? Those are the ones who feed on the sincere milk of the word in order to grow up to become perfected beings, right? So keep all those scriptures in mind when you read those things. And notice, the gods whom Yahweh was counseling were, in fact, the sons of Yahweh. In Psalm 82, verse 6, he says, I have said you are gods, you sons of the Most High. Okay, so they're sons of the Most High. You know, that, that, would, <laughs> that just blows the mind of the world, you know. I mean, can you imagine trying to talk to a Christian and telling them what, who they worship and, and, and what they worship and what a God is and how a God 
you know, was actually a son of Yahweh who turned against Yahweh, you know, to them, uh, these, they see, that's the big G, okay? That's the big G you talked about there. The little Gs are just these little false gods. And to, to the, in the minds of the people, well, those are false. You know, those are all, that's all the mythology and all that kind of stuff that, that doesn't really exist. All that's not real, you know. Little do they know, you know, that this, this mythology is the things that these gods came up with, and much of it is, it is real and, and, and truth and stuff, because it's telling about the stories of the things in which they did, okay? But it just blows their mind to think of the fact that, you know, these gods were the sons of Yahweh. You know, they have no idea. So, and this is what Satan has done, is because she wants them to think that they're going to be a part of the God family. Not the family of Yahweh, but of the God family. But these sons, they had exalted themselves as gods, remember, as Lucifer did. And as we read in the latter part of this verse here, keep in mind the scriptural definition of God. And in Psalm 82, verse 5, it says, And all the foundations of the earth are shaken because of you. They're the reason why all this took place. And these beings were the first to visit the earth after Yahweh had created the heavens that govern it in the earth. And because of their godly, lawless behavior, that the foundations of the earth were shaken. And it's also because of their disobedience to Yahweh's laws that the earth was covered in darkness and became without form, as we see in Genesis 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth became without form, and empty and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay? It was darkness upon the face of the deep. Of course, this is getting to something that's, that, again, they, they don't really understand. They couldn't comprehend this. And remember now, this darkness was upon the earth. Remember, it's not just the earth that, that uh, sustains life for mankind. Okay? It's all the heavens as well. All the heavens that actually that Yahweh made there that you read about in Genesis that allows the firmament to do its job and to be able to keep the, the earth in this, in this position and so forth and to keep mankind alive upon the earth. And the firmament stretches out way beyond the earth's atmosphere and so forth. Uh, but when these gods came in to destroy the earth and to do away with these things, that's, maybe that's possibly where, why, um, maybe that's why the moon has potholes on it, huh? you know, from the destruction that took place. Maybe that's why Mars has been destroyed the way it is, where there's no, and the other planets where you see no physical life, type of life that exists on them and so forth, you know, because of all the destruction that took place. Because they, the gods know that if you, you know, it's not just the earth, planet Earth, but if you destroy the heavens around the Earth, which is placed there to keep the Earth alive, Therefore, you can actually destroy mankind on the earth itself. Because if you destroy what supports the earth, you would destroy the creatures that live on earth. But notice the word darkness here in this verse. Uh, and it's a different Hebrew word that's used than the one that's used in, in Psalm 82, 5. But it, needs, it means the same. It means misery. Okay, because these people are miserable. These beings are miserable without the laws of Yahweh. You know, without Yahweh's laws, they, they, they live in total misery. There's no joy. There's no peace. There's, there's no enjoyment of life. The, you know, this is why they, they treat one another the way they do, because they hate one another. You know, they literally hate one another because love, remember, comes from Yahweh. Remember, what is, Yahweh, what is love? The scripture plainly tells you it's Yahweh. It's Yahweh, loving Yahweh and keeping his laws. That's how you know what love is. The gods don't keep the laws of Yahweh, so they're full of hate. They hate one another. They're fighting against one another. This is why there's so much competition, okay? And this is why the world is the way it is. Remember, they influence the minds of mankind, and that's why there's competition in everything that you do. You can't have a company and be the only company that produces index cards because the next company is going to come along with a colored index card and the next one will come along with another one that's fluorescent colored or whatever. You know, they're always trying to outdo one another in everything that you look upon on the face of this earth. There's always competition in the different companies competing against one another. Okay? And of course, 
Yahweh doesn't do that. Yahweh's already made everything beautiful, okay? Yahweh doesn't have to compete amongst the gods or anybody else to make a beautiful flower. In fact, he's made millions and millions and millions of these things all over the place, okay? There's so many millions, and that's probably a small number, but there's so many millions right now, they know, they estimate that there's like, you know, that there's millions of species that they've never discovered yet on the face of this earth. And there's millions and millions of different types of flowers and grasses and trees and bushes and insects and birds and everything else and snakes and insects, all these things that Yahweh has made all over the earth that mankind has never discovered because he's never gone to every part of the earth. There's still places where he's never been. And all of these things, you know, I mean, they even found um, ice worms. You know, there's worms that live in ice underneath the Arctic ice. You know, when they've drilled down in cores of ice and going into there, they've found ice worms. You know, that they literally live on the ice, in the ice. You know, things like this that mankind has no earthly idea of what the reason for all these things are. But it's all there to keep us alive. And we may think, okay, that old butterfly that's over there in the other side of the world, what do I need that for? You know, it can go extinct. It doesn't matter. Well, what's it, how's it going to affect me? I'm a human being, you know. Who cares about a butterfly? Let the butterfly die off. Well, if one species dies off like they have done already, when they become extinct, that affects every other being on this earth because everything that Yahweh has made has a part in the plan of Yahweh to keep man alive. And if something dies off and becomes extinct, that part of it is no longer there to keep mankind alive. And so therefore it adds to the part of bringing the curses upon mankind and allowing him to suffer the curses that he brought upon himself. And when something becomes extinct, it becomes extinct because man kills it off. That's the only reason. And, of course, that's through the God's influence. They know this, you know, they know those things. Okay, so these were the, some of the first gods of Yahweh, some of the first sons of Yahweh, I mean, who became gods, okay? These were sons. They went astray from Yahweh's way of living and following after their own lust and rebellion against Yahweh. They created monsters of war and what we know as dinosaurs. From the knowledge that we have now, you know, these primitive creatures, their only purpose was for war games between the gods. And it seems that each one was created more vicious than the other, uh, the one before it, because they were made strictly for the purpose of fighting and killing. Dinosaur. Dinosaur means, it's, the Greek word means terrible lizard. It's a terrible lizard. Okay? And there's also a lizard that's called a dragon, or the flying lizard, because it has... Um, skin between the front legs and the back legs, which kind of looks like wings and allows it to kind of like soar through the air. But it's a dragon, okay, a flying lizard. And remember, Satan is called the dragon, that old serpent, okay? That old serpent called the dragon. But these dinosaurs, they were, they, they were meant for one, re one reason only, as Pastor has explained already. Well, he goes on, he says, Today's spirit's the same. It's strange, he says, yet not surprising, that many of the games I see today represent the same violence and warlike gods practice, uh, warlike ways practiced by the gods. And that's exactly true. You know, today, if you own a computer, okay, and you update what's called the driver, okay, a driver is part of a, 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 the software that, that, uh, that causes different parts of the computer to operate correctly, okay? Let me just put it that way, very simple. When you install these drivers, they will always come up with a little, there's always a little box on the screen that will pop up. And they always show on there advertisements for all these different games. And when it flashes through, that's all that you see is war. War, war, war. They make it look futuristic, you know, when they have these guys and these in these robotic looking suits and stuff, or else they have the futuristic looking weapons with them, or the tanks and all this kind of stuff. But it always makes it look glorious. They make it look real glorious. And there's even one called the assassin, okay, when a guy goes around assassinating people. Murder looks glamorous 
in the eyes of the gods, and they portray this in the eyes of the people. All this is the same thing that they did with these dinosaurs. This is where they got these ideas from. They just put it in a different form in the minds of the people today. So, the, and these games are available in virtually every store that you go to. You know, shopping, any shopping mall worldwide, they're there. Video games are stationed in just about every grocery store and restaurant. And it can easily be purchased for home use or computer use as well. So, some of these games even feature dinosaur against dinosaur. Okay? And they're enjoyed by old and young people alike. Okay? You know what the average age of, of gamers are? 30 years old. 30 years old. You would think that a man 30 years old would be a grown-up, don't you think? I mean, 30 years old, come on, you know? Yeshua certainly was, because that was the, 30 was the, year, the age of when the priests trained. You know, you began training around 25 to 30. When you turned 30, then you could go into the priesthood and become, become a, a, a priest and serve in the ministry of the priest. And yet here these guys are, they're priests, all right, priests of the video games, you know? Learn how to, how to kill, and that's exactly what they do. Because when they came up with these games to begin with, you know, um, they actually used the video games in the training the soldiers, because they, they even um, had their virtual games and stuff, and had their suits, and put on their helmets with their, with their virtual mask and stuff, and actually go out and take actual scenery from war scenes and took scenery from Iraq and all these places and the villages and, and, and came and put them into these games and the soldiers would come and they would train. You know, they had their guns, they didn't have real weapons, but they were electronic guns and they would actually make the firing sound and the actual, in the video that they could see the screens in front of their eyes was actually the firing of the weapon. They could see the fire coming out and see the bullet tracers and so forth. And they trained them to get them prepared to be able to go into these villages to be able to take these over. And then, of course, they'd have the enemy pop out, you know, and it'd have them blow them away. But this is what they put into their minds to actually train them. You know, it goes back to the time of, of what they did with the dinosaurs. They're just doing it in a different way in the minds of the people today. Now, it's not... Strange, however, knowing that their lawless behavior, knowing that the gods would enjoy watching this constant fighting and killing and seeing that the same warlike spirit enjoyed by the world today, it's the same warlike spirit that brought this destruction, remember, to the earth before mankind was ever created. The spirit's the same. Only, only, the, only the games have been changed from the real thing to the make-believe. Okay? You know, when you think about the games, too, um, and the flying serpent. No, uh, you remember when Pope Pope Benny? Okay, that's an affectionate term. Okay, when when Pope Benedict, whenever he he left, he got in his helicopter and he was flying over, and they made a big deal out of his leaving, and they showed him flying over. Did you notice when he when he was flying over where he went? He passed right over the Roman Colosseum. Okay, and the Roman Colosseum was a place where these games took place, okay? And, and, and of course, they had, this is where they, they slaughtered the people of Yahweh in there, and they had the gladiators and things, that they, the war games, and they fought. These were all war games. They, they fought against one another. They battled against one another in the gladiators. And they even got to the point to where, when they got bored with that, you know, I guess maybe they ran out of animals and had to go after some more, then what they would do is they would, they would actually block up the Colosseum and flood it with water and bring ships in there and have games. They'd have naval games, and they would, they would actually float the ships out there and fight against one another and, you know, burn one another up and so forth. Uh, so, you know, it just, they just wanted to show off their power, whether it was on land or, or, or sea or whatever. They had to show that they could destroy no matter what they did. Um... Okay, he goes on, Pastor says, Mankind was, has accepted the way of the gods, the way that was offered to Mother Eve in the Garden of Eden. Not only have they taken the same spirit of the gods and rejected Yahweh's perfect laws of love, but they've carried the spirit of the gods with them for most of their history. The spirit of greed and lust and hatred. Because mankind has chosen the way of the gods, he has also waged brutal wars throughout history. And although the results have been devastating so far, mankind will con still continues 
in the inevitable path of destruction inherited from the gods, even to the point of nuclear destruction, a nuclear devastation, knowing that first strike what first strike would do. First strike means one thing, that you're the first one to push the button, okay? But when you do that, you know, because of the pride that builds up that they are the superpower, they can do this, you don't realize that once you push that button, you've just destroyed yourself. Because you can wipe out the whole nation that you're going after. They don't have to fire one bullet at you. But what you've just done is now you've sent those nuclear weapons over there. They're going to explode and they're going to put all the radiation and stuff up into the air. And now within a matter of weeks, it's going to come drop down on you. Does that make a lot of sense? You know, but it's in their minds to take what is not theirs through force, just like these gods did. Just like they did with the games long ago. Now, King David. He was inspired to write in Psalm 8, verse 5, that man was made a little lower than the Malachim, or the angels. And this means, of course, that the Malachim possessed powers and abilities that's not given to man when he was created. This also means that the Malachim, or the angels, can do the things that will bring financial benefits to mankind. Now, that's what the great horror is based upon, right? It's based upon the fact that the merchants of the earth will mourn when they see the system come tumbling down eventually. Everything is based upon money. So they can have financial benefits to mankind. Now remember, it says in uh, Ecclesiastes 9, ver uh, 10, verse 19, a feast is made for laughter and wine is made for making life pleasant. But money is made for everything. Money is made for everything. Well, they know. You know, King Solomon knew that when he wrote that. However, the scripture also says it's the love of money that is a root of all evil, right? So there's nothing wrong with having the money. Abraham was a rich man, okay, with the, with in, according to the terms that were there in his days. Eob was given things. However, the money didn't mean anything to them. They used it for one purpose, and that was to further the work of Yahweh. That's why when Abraham had 300-something servants, you think it was so that he could be prestigious in the eyes of the people? No, he knew the laws of Yahweh, and he saw and came across people who were devastated and couldn't survive. So he says, come and be my servant, and I will take care of you. And that's why he took them in. All of these men taught the laws of Yahweh and kept the laws of Yahweh. It wasn't the love of money that drove them to, to have this, but that's what the gods do. The gods put into mind to people, drive for the finances, you know, be all that you can be. Go for, they want to go for the gold too, okay? But they want to go for the, for the gold that's on, on this earth that they think can actually uh, benefit them. Which, you know, people have even had made gold coffins. But uh, they ain't enjoying it, you know? Ask any Pharaoh and see if, if he's enjoying the things that he's been buried with, okay? Now, the prophet Uremia, he shows, uh, he shows an excellent example of this very same thing here about the queen of heaven. In Uremia 44, verses 4 and 5, he says, However, I have sent all my servants, the prophets, to you, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. So this, the, the prophets warned him. He says, look, you, you, you're committing an abomination. Don't do this, Yahweh says. He hates this. Don't do these things. But notice verse 5, but they did not obey, nor incline their ear to pay attention, to turn from the wickedness, and to seize burning incense to hinder gods. They wanted this incense burnt to them so that they could get the recognition. And they promised them, that they were going to give them something in return, okay? You remember 44 verse 15 says, Then all the men who knew their wives had burned incense to the hinder gods, together with all the women who stood by a great multitude in all, and all the people who lived in the land of Egypt and in the country of Petros, answered Uremia saying, Now notice, all these men who knew that their wives were burning incense to the hinder gods. 
You remember what we read earlier about what Yahweh says to the assembly of the gods, like Adam, you will die. Okay? So these men did the same thing like Adam. Remember, Adam wasn't deceived. Okay? Eve was deceived. Adam made a choice. Okay? He made the choice to sin. Eve was deceived into thinking that everything would be all right and she, she sinned. But Adam wasn't deceived, the scripture says. He made the choice. He could have stood up and said, Eve, you know, stop it, okay? But he didn't. Instead, he allowed her to do that, and then he made the choice, well, I guess in the run, I didn't follow along with it, okay? But he followed it. Okay, and that's what these men did here. They were quite aware of what their wives were doing. They were burning incense to the queen of heaven. Why? Because they saw the benefit that took place. Notice. It's why they didn't say anything. They said to Urim the prophet of Yahweh, concerning the word that you have spoken to us in the name of Yahweh. So they, they knew that this came forth from Yahweh. They knew the authority that he stood in. But they said, we won't listen to you. Okay? That's the same as Israel Hawkins telling the world, stop your sinning and pleading with all flesh. And they turn around and say, you're a cult leader. I don't want to hear you. Okay, I'm going to continue to do what I want to do. I'm going to continue to worship Satan. I'm not going to listen to you. That's what these men were doing. We will not listen to you. Instead, we will certainly do what we have vowed to do. Okay, now remember, a vow... It's something that you make a promise and you enter into a covenant with somebody when you make a vow and they vow to the gods, okay? We will certainly do what we have vowed to do. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her just as we and our fathers and our kings and our princesses used to do in the cities of Yada. Now remember what they told Samuel. Make us a king. We want a king so we can be just like all the other nations. In the cities of Yada, in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food. We were successful and experienced no trouble. Okay? So we had plenty of food. We had, man, we had a luxurious living when we were burning these, this incense to the queen of heaven. And we were successful. Remember what, what Yahweh says? Remember what we read earlier about succeeding? Succeeding is, you know, referring to the keeping the laws of Yahweh, that he teaches us the way to succeed by walking in the ways of righteousness. But instead, they looked at their success. They measured it according to worldly terms, okay? According to what the cardinal mind experienced. And they experienced no trouble. Oh, they were at peace amongst themselves, quote, unquote, Okay? But the only ones that that would have been with were ones who, who were, had more, uh, a bigger army to keep the others away. That's why they use force. You know I mean? That's why they use weapons, a, a bigger weapon, and that's why they say that nuclear power works. Okay? That's why if you have a nuclear bomb, then another country who doesn't have a nuclear bomb is not going to mess with you. But if another country has a nuclear bomb, then you've got to have two nuclear bombs. And if you've got two nuclear bombs, they're going to have four. And then you've got to have eight, and so on and so on and so on. And that's what they call the arms race, is they try to build up more and more weapons, thinking that the more that they had, the more fear they would put in a person, and they wouldn't do anything to them. But they're too blind to think that ten nuclear bombs is enough to destroy the earth. So you don't need thousands and thousands of them. But they don't understand that. So, it says now, since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we've lacked everything and we've been consumed by the sword and by famine. Well, they brought this upon themselves. Okay? But they thought, okay, you know, if we, if we offer to the gods... Then the gods will give us the benefits. The gods will give us the finances that we need. And they will bless us with these things. And that's what it's always been with God worship. You know, they've always put in the minds of man that they could receive benefits 
from worshiping them. And that that's why you had the worship of the sun god. The, the worship of the sun god far surpasses probably anything else on the whole face of this earth. And that's why you see in the Catholic Church, sun discs are everywhere. The hosts rest inside of the big, I forget what the name of it is, but it's a place where the host rests and the sun bursts all around it and stuff. It's, it's everywhere. You see it in the Bibles. You see it all over the place where you see the Tetragrammaton even inside a triangle, which represents the Trinity with sun burst all over the place. The sun god, which is what Mithraism or Christianity comes from, the worship of the sun god was tremendous because of the fact that you can't live without the sun you know you die without sunlight you've got to have sun to survive even the plankton on the bottom of the ocean ocean they've got to have sunlight you know we think of sunlight well the sunlight is just a light that comes down you know we see everything you know remember light is light is is a particle and a ray so therefore the particles that come forth from the sun certainly have enough uh, energy and sense to hit the the ocean and go through the water and go down to the bottom of the ocean and supply those little creatures that need that that stuff. It's just you can't see it as a big bright light, you know. But it has an effect on everything that is on this earth. And so the sun god represented life itself. And so this is why they worship the sun god so much. And, and, and that's why they based, remember the seasons like Easter and so forth and springtime and you have Christmas time and winter when the dying off of the God and the God comes back to life and brings everything back into, into life. So they believe that these gods had the power and his influence. Now all this comes back from Genesis chapter 1. You remember in Genesis chapter 1, Yahweh made everything and he said he made it right. He made it righteous. He made this. And he made everything after its own kind, and it was righteous. It was made exactly the way that it was supposed to have been made. So, and he also made the sun, the moon, the stars, all of these things that keep the earth alive, right? That, that causes mankind to have life here on this earth. And then he warned the people, he says, when you look up, give glory and honor to Yahweh, but don't fall into the deception of worshiping these gods are the hosts of heaven because it's these hosts that's in the heavens are the ones that's responsible for keeping the earth going they're the ones responsible to keep the planets spinning at the the rotation that's supposed to be and stay in the orbits and everything that's out there has everybody all these beings have a job to keep everything that's out there in the universe working properly it's when they fail to do that is when the destruction takes place and scientists knows that the astronomers knows that they see the destruction that's out there in the universe of, of things that are exploding and running into one another and these kind of things it's because they have turned from Yahweh and now they're trying to destroy those things because the gods know if they could destroy just part of the universe it would destroy mankind completely it would wipe man out they, they couldn't exist if that was the case because everything works together to keep mankind alive uh, we got to stop here. We're going to stop on page 77 here in the middle of the page. Um, and the priest can take off next week at that place. May Yahweh bless your understanding, men. Uh, please stand. Let's go ahead and raise our hands. Almighty Heavenly Father Yahweh, this is going Michael Hawkins. Ask him come before you. Being seed of your last day's witnesses, Rayuel Hawkins, and through your son, Yeshua Messiah, the high priest of your house. Thank you, Father, for your great blessings of being able to rehearse these words. We ask and pray that you continue to strengthen our minds, strengthen our hearts, and help us, Father, to be determined to uh, do your will, Father, and to be faithful unto you. We ask and pray your blessings upon this week. Uh, continue to watch over us and help us in the things that we do. Continue to keep your people safe and protected. Uh, continue to help us, Father, and give us health and the strength that we need to be able to do this work, Father. Continue to bless all the things that you've given into your house, Father, so that keep us alive. We thank you, Father, for your great blessings of, of the things that we see and being able to have the eyes to see and enjoy the beauty and the ears to be able to hear the, the sounds and all the things that you bless us with, Father, for making us as mankind. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We ask you to go with us in peace. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh.